with a book and with a just a short 18 page magazine that you could keep and if you had anybody else around you that is struggling trying to figure out it it becomes a an interesting opportunity to engage in discussion this is a great magazine we'll make in fact there's some available but you'll know how to use that um, we'll have a great discussion we were only going to do two but they've been so positive that we're doing another one so we'll do it today at 4 30 we'll go from 4 30 to 6 30 um, conversation will be fun so if you're kind of thinking that you might show up show up how about that we're talking about Passing life's toughest test. Kind of where we're going in our the next message series, we're going to be in there for the next five weeks or so. When we think about that, um, if you approach the Bible, uh, it won't take you long. If you say, say you're approaching the Bible for the first time, you've really never been aware of it, don't know anything it has to say you won't be too far in the Bible before you start to run into some themes that will come up again and again. Things that you'll identify as these must be really important. One of the things you'd come up with is faith. Faith matters most to God in the Bible. Uh, we find different things, different places where this is true. Right from the very beginning, Abraham, Abram, who became Abram, was a man who in responding to God with faith and believing was credited by God with righteousness. Later on in the book of Habakkuk, it said the just will live by his faith. In the New Testament, it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Um, the Bible from fore to aft, beginning to end, highlights the importance of faith. Faith matters most to God. And it gets a little tricky because the Bible indicates as well that it's possible to come close to God and say words that express faith, but God doesn't necessarily go on the basis of what our words say. Uh, it says in Isaiah, these people come near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their mouths. So what is said from here up that is good enough, but God doesn't look at that. He looks at what's inside, and that's really the place where doubt lives and makes faith a challenging thing. The Bible talks about tests of faith, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit over the course of the next five weeks, deal with it from, from different perspectives. This is life's toughest test. It has eternal, con eternal ramifications. So we'll talk about why faith is tested and how. Talk about preparing for the test. Then we'll look at a couple case studies. One in which somebody failed the test, and then we'll close the series by looking at one who passed it. Let's think a little bit about what it means for our faith to be tested. Look at the top verse. There's a sheet with some verses written in it. And if you would look at the top one, James talks about Faith being tested. And this is what he says. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He talks about faith being tested. Let's talk about a couple of questions. What does it mean for faith to be tested? And then we'll talk about why our faith is tested. And again, next week we'll talk about how. What does it mean for our faith to be tested? Let's define a couple terms. What's faith mean? Look at the definition. Faith it could be seen as confidence in God's faithfulness in the face of conflicting evidence. Confidence in God's faithfulness in the face of conflicting evidence. Different things we think of when we think of faith. I, I told the story. This is an embellished version of this story. A man named Jack was walking along a steep cliff one day when he accidentally got too close to the edge and fell. On the way down, he grabbed a branch, which temporarily stopped his fall. He looked down to his horror, saw that the canyon fell straight down for more than 1,000 feet. He couldn't hang on to the branch forever, and there was no way for him to climb up the steep wall of the cliff. So Jack began yelling for help, hoping that someone passing by would hear him and lower a rope or something. Help, help, is anybody up there? 
Help, he yelled for a long time, but no one heard him. He was about to give up when he heard a voice. Jack, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'm down here. I can see you, Jack. Are you all right? Yes, but who are you and where are you? I am the Lord, Jack, and I'm everywhere. The Lord, you mean God? That's me. God, please help me. I promise if you'll get me down from here, I will stop sinning. I'll be a really good person. I'll serve you for the rest of your, my life. Easy on the promises, Jack. Let me get you off from there, then we can talk. Now, here's what I want you to do. Listen carefully. I'll do anything, Lord. Just tell me what to do. Okay, let go of the branch. What? I said let go of the branch. Just trust me, let go. There was a long silence. Finally, Jack yelled, Help, help, is anybody else up? Anybody else up there? When we think of faith, we think of something that uh, kind of plunging into the abyss. When the Bible talks about faith, it, it, there's something challenging to faith. It's something not easy. Again, faith is confidence in God's faithfulness in the face of conflicting evidence. And the person who is kind of the, one of the initial charter members of the Bible Hall of Faith is Abraham, who God approached when he was 75 years old and said, you're going to be the father of many nations. Most people in his day, they lived a couple hundred years, but most of his Grand, his grandfathers and great, 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 great grandfathers, they had kids by the time they were 30. Um, Abram's father had to wait till 70 to have a kid. Abram was 75 at this time, no kids. And then God said to him, you're going to be the father of many nations. He believed God, believed that even though he was 75, which not quite middle age because most people, again, lived a couple hundred years, but still he was getting to the place where uh, he should have had kids by then. Um, Believe God. Fifteen years passed, no kids. God approached him again when he was 80, again ten years later when he was 85 and assured him that he was going to give him a family. He would be the father of many nations. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. God said, that's what I'm looking for. Um, but it was another 14 years before God approached him again and said, I'm going to give you a kid. And now at this time, Sarah kind of laughed. That's what her name means, one who laughs. Um, She was 99, and even in the longevity that they experienced, past childbearing, uh, Abram was old, and um, yet he still believed. Look what it says relative to Abram's response. It says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Abram could have based his confidence in God on a couple things. See, when somebody gives you a promise, you have the choice of believing it or not believing it, and that's really what faith is all about. Faith centers in a person. And when we think of faith, we think of dropping off into an abyss, but that's really not what faith is about. Faith is something personal. And when somebody says to you, this is what I will do, faith is that which enables you to either have confidence that this person is going to pull through or not. Some of you know individuals who say often, I'll be there for you. And you have no faith in them because you've experienced the fact that they've made promises to you before and they haven't kept them. You might have faith in one person because they keep their promises. You think of people? I'm sure you can think of some people, their word is as good as gold. They say, I'll do this, and you have faith. Why? Because faith centers in a person. And you know that that person will be faithful to do what they say they will do. Faith centers in a person. It's not dropping off into an abyss. You also, again, have people who make promises and don't follow through. So since faith centers in a person... The person is not a very credible object of faith. Sometimes we think of faith as it really doesn't matter what you or who you have faith in just as long as you have faith in something, in the talk shows. Oh, it doesn't matter what you have faith in, just believe strongly in something. 
I think that, that doesn't make much sense to me. The fact is, there are credible and incredible objects of faith. You know the infomercials. There's stuff out there that says that you send this in, you get a million dollars. I'm always getting stuff on the internet challenging me to give this detail and that detail, and I'm going to get this or that or the other, and I'm at the place now because you're so deluged with you, we understand those promises are meaningless. It's the same thing with spiritual issues. A lot of individuals claim to be credible objects of faith. Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus Christ, are they all the same? Is any one more credible than another? You say, See, that's a, that's a key point. Faith is only as good as its object. Faith centers in a person. Faith claims the promises. That's what faith does. When God makes a promise, faith is that which says, okay, you said that, and I think you're going to pull through. Is God going to keep his promises to you? Good question. The problem is, we hope he does, but faith is challenged by problems. Right? Right? So you could say, yeah, I can see that God's done some things for me in the past. And yeah, I can kind of believe him, but there have been those other times, Mike, where God didn't come through. And you know what faith is? Confidence in God's faithfulness in the face of conflicting evidence. Let me ask you, has God been 100% faithful to give you what you want? Come on, of course he hasn't. Hasn't with me. There's some things that I thought really God was going to give me that are good things that I didn't get. If I'm going to judge God's faithfulness by his track record in doing everything I thought he would do, my faith is not very strong. Faith is only as credible as the object. It claims the promises, and it's challenged by problems. What faith is, confidence in God's faithfulness in the face of conflicting evidence. So some of us feel funny about thinking that, well, you know, I, God... It was kind of disappointing what God did back there. Some of us are right in that situation right now. Frankly, Mike, I'd like to believe more in God, but he hasn't been doing very well by me. I understand that. Faith is confidence in God's faithfulness in the face of conflicting evidence, and that's where tests of faith come in. Look what it says. A test of faith, painful circumstances that teach us to base our confidence on what God says rather than what we see. You can base your confidence in God on two things, on what he says or what you see. God's promises are bulletproof. They're never going to change. When we base our confidence on what God says, there's a firm foundation for our faith. Those words aren't going to change. The problem is, when we're trying to base our faith on what he says, confidence, it's hard not to look around at us at circumstances in our life that are scary. I know you said you'd be there for me, God, but look at that. Look at why, what, and, and now we, we're trying to base confidence, but we're, we're really gazing at our circumstances. I think it's real hard to maintain and sustain faith when I'm gazing at my circumstances, because some of my circumstances don't look all that hot. I was thinking once when I was at a place in my life where I thought God was going to do this, and he didn't, and I was on the road. I was thinking of myself as sometimes when I'm traveling. And you ever been traveling, and you don't know whether you took the wrong road or not? You know, some, I travel and I just space off, and I just, I, don't, I guess I'm going on autopilot, and I took turns, and I, I really never thought of taking turns. And then I'm on this road, and I'm trying to think of, did I take the right I should have taken? And then, you know, you try to look for the familiar sign. You've done that, right? You try to look for the familiar, and they're not there. And then you go on and on, and finally, you know, there's no road, street, you know, you don't know what highway you're on, and... It goes on and on and on, and you say, I don't know if I'm on the right road or not. I feel like that sometimes in terms of my life. I look at my life, and if I'm looking at my circumstances, sometimes I have to say, I don't know if I'm on a good road or not. That looks scary. That really looks scary. Up ahead, that looks scary. That bend looks dark. I don't know whether I'm on a good road or not. I was thinking about that once, and it occurred to me that I'm a sheep. 
Don't laugh, so are you. <laughs> sheep aren't really intelligent. <laughs> so I was thinking that, you know what, I don't think sheep, they don't have a, a, a lot of gray matter. Sheep aren't, aren't the best ones to determine whether they're on a good road or not. And that it occurred to me. Mike, wrong question. The question isn't whether this is a good road or not. The question is, do you have a good shepherd? Because it's his job to determine if the road is good or not. You stuck in the wrong question? Looking around, I don't know if this is a good road or not. Is this a good road? I don't know. I see things are scary. Things in my house are scary. Things at the job are scary. It's dark. Now it's dark up ahead. I don't know if I'm on a good road. Am I on a good road or not? Wrong question. Do you have a good shepherd? Do you? Do you have a good shepherd? If you do, it's his job to know the road. And you can keep you can have confidence in the fact that if he's a good shepherd, he'll get you to a good place. So here it is again. Do you have a good shepherd? See, I'd like to believe I do, Mike, but I'm looking up. I'm not telling you to look around. He says he is a good shepherd. And faith is that which bases confidence on what he says rather than what you see. Hard not to look around. Test of faith, painful circumstances where God leads us, but he seems to lead us on a road that doesn't seem to be a real great road. Look what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live by, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We'll look at this passage carefully next week in terms of how does God test our faith, but what it looked like here, God led them from place to place. And when he led them from point A to point B, they were hoping that there would be good things at point B. What ended up happening at point B? No water, no food. How am I going to get to point C? That's what a test of faith is. When you end up landing in a circumstance that makes you feel insecure, that raises questions as to how am I going to get from there to there? And it raises some really difficult, deep questions. What it says here, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years. See, it felt to them like they were walking in circles. But they weren't walking in circles. God was leading them, but he was leading them from place to place to catch up with these. Here we are, painful circumstances to teach us to base our confidence on what God says rather than on what we see. It raises questions when we think we're following God and he leads us to uncomfortable places where our family doesn't look like we thought our family should look like. And we start to wonder, do I have one who is guiding me or not? I don't know, Mike, if he's guiding me because I'm looking at my life and it's not what I thought it would be. So he must not be guiding me because he led me to this place and this place is, doesn't feel like a good place. So he must not be guiding me because God, God would never lead me to an uncomfortable place. Oh, is that right? God would never lead it? Well, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you. He caused you to hunger. And then he fed you with manna which neither you nor your fathers had known. A test of faith, painful circumstances. It raises all kinds of questions, though. What is this about? Why does he have to do this? If he's all-powerful, if he knows everything, what, is this kind of experiment or something? He puts me in the situation and he feels like he's just playing games. Test of faith, when you think of what it is, can raise some difficult questions, especially if you're in a situation where you're dealing with things that have been difficult and they've been difficult for a while, chronic suffering. Haven't I suffered enough? I mean, enough is enough. 
What do I need to prove? I have to have more stuff taken away? When are you going to be done with me? You ever ask questions like that? Haven't you found out what you need to find out yet? Isn't it clear? OK, I can't do it. I'm supposed to trust you, but I can't. Haven't you learned? Back off. Raise a difficult question. You say, that's blasphemous. See, the questions are real. Ask the real questions. See, sometimes we feel like if we say nice words and cover over painful thoughts, that God doesn't see the painful thoughts. See, that was the problem with them. Their mouth and their words were close, but their heart was far. Say the good words, but know that God sees your heart. And it's okay to ask the questions. Why is our faith tested? Why is our faith tested? Answer one, because we have a good father. Look what it says. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. It describes testing. Another word for testing is discipline. Another word for testing is discipline. Oh, that's, a, that's helpful. <laughs> Boy, hey, that's great, Mike. Thanks. Um, for some, um, what, is, what does discipline seem like to you, depending on your background? Some of it is a sadistic father. Stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Some of you heard that. I didn't hit you that hard. Stop crying. It's hard not to take that analogy of discipline and throw it right over on God. And when you're in an uncomfortable circumstance, making the same association, that God says, stop crying. Toughen up or discipline. I mean, is that the picture? For some, it's not a sadistic father. It's an absentee father. He was never there to begin with. You have no, no sense of a father because he really wasn't engaged. He's just kind of out there. Providing some things long term, nothing personal. So when you think of discipline, it, it, you know what you understand what I mean? It gets, kind of gets all mixed together. So God becomes like your father was. Is he? What does his discipline mean? What is it like? Interesting thing, there's, uh, there's a difference between discipline and punishment. We've seen this before. Uh, let's take a peek at this. There's, for discipline and punishment, there's different motives for each and a different focus for each. The motive for discipline is love. That's why you discipline. When it talks about this word in the Bible, again, we've talked about it before, really important you get this clear. Discipline is child rearing. It comes from two words, to be with a child. Be with a child. That's literally the word. And here's the picture. With a child that you care about alongside him, walking with him, trying to bring your influence to support him so that he will be able to be everything that God wants him to be. That's discipline. And the, the focus of discipline is love. The focus of that is future obedience. See, that's what you're thinking about when it's discipline. You're looking at where he is and you're thinking about how to make him the man or woman that you want him to be and you involve him in things. Some of those might be painful, but it's not about getting back at him. You're thinking about the future things that he'll do right. That's discipline. Punishment is a different thing. Punishment is about wrath. That's the motive for punishment. And the focus of punishment is past disobedience. It's you did that and you're going to pay so that you can balance the scales. You did this bad thing, a bad thing's going to happen to you because the scales have got to balance. Sometimes when we hear the word discipline, we get that image in our mind, that there are scales. Okay, I messed up, and now here it comes, <laughs> job, demotion. And we start to think that's how God balances the scales, that he's looking at the bad thing that we did, and he's saying, okay, I'm sorry I have to do this. This hurts, hurts me more than it hurts you. Bam! That's ridiculous. 
Well, it's not ridiculous. I used to believe it too. <laughs> it's not the truth. Not the truth. We have a good father. Uh, God disciplines those he loves. It says um, in that verse, Hebrews, My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. You know what happened? You know the... It's difficult to go through something painful. You know what's more difficult? Going through something painful and going through it all alone. That's a kicker. I think that's the way we can differentiate between fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety. Fear is facing something threatening. Anxiety is facing it all alone. Does that make sense? You get that? Fear is inevitable. We will face things that are threatening. If your eyes are open, you're going to see things that are scary. If your eyes are open, if you don't face things that are scary, your head's stuck in the sand. This is not heaven. And there's some very frightening things that happen on this world, on this planet. Fear is the awareness that there's threat. Anxiety is the sense that you're facing it alone. You're not alone. That's what they were starting to believe, and that's why he says, listen, don't make light of the Lord's discipline because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes the word there, discipline. It translated punish. The image is not about wrathful get back. It's about I'm with you. We're going to walk through this together. It's going to be painful. You'll be a better person. I am with you. So if you're in a tough spot, you say, Mike, there's things I'm afraid of. I get that. I'm afraid of some things too. You know what the deal is with us? If you, and if you want the relationship, you're not alone. And we can kind of feel like we're alone. We feel like if something bad happens, God zigged and we zagged. Why? Because every book out says if you're doing it right, God will lift the bad circumstance. Where does it say that? You think the same thing I do, though. When you're in the middle of a bad circumstance, boy, poo, gee whiz, I've got to figure out what God's teaching me. Because once I figure out what God's teaching me, he'll call off the goons. You know, he sent the leg breakers. Okay, I'm going to have to break your leg. You did it again. And then we've got to figure out the lesson. And then when we figure out the lesson, then God calls off the dogs. He calls back the hit men. He goes, okay, just make, just make sure that doesn't happen again. That is not true. God does not do that. There's a benefit to discipline just in terms of having to persevere. That's what faith, God, this is hard, but you say that this, you're with me, and this isn't heaven. Heaven is coming and continuing to walk. It doesn't mean that you don't have lapses of doubt. Face them, but know that that's the deal. And you're going to go through difficult things. It's not always about a specific lesson. Can I ask you to do something? Well, you could say no, I'm still going to ask you to do it. So, shut up. (laughs) Don't insult God like that. Is God teaching you something? Maybe. Is it about figuring out what God's teaching you so that he can take that bad circumstance back? No. Discipline is not just about taking things away, it's about adding things. The word is, it's the word that you get the word gymnasium from. I go to a a spinning class and I put myself through torture, but the reason why I do that is not because I am punishing myself. It's because of what I can add. Cardiovascular ability, leg strength. I can can do more things. That's what difficult circumstances are like. It's not just taking away because you're doing something bad. It's building muscle. 
And that's why God puts us through stuff. It's not because he hates us. Stop treating him like that. And, don't read, and just when you read a book that indicates that, just do what I do. <clears throat> Wrong. I find I have to do that more and more and more and more and more in what I read. A father accomplishes good purposes. Uh, look what it says. Our father has disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. There's a thing that differentiates God's from our parents. Our parents aren't perfect. <laughs> I, I, you know, when you say stuff like that and you're with your family, gee, boy, that's right. <laughs> you got that right. Um, God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. I remember my mother once, I, I, <laughs> I love drinking I drank out of the bottle right out of the fridge. You know, I'd just go in there, drink and pop, just, you know, and even milk. You know, i just, you know, do a little spig. This is disgusting now. I don't want to do it. So you take a little thing and just, you know, because I don't want to get a glass. And I remember once my mother caught me. She goes, okay, that's it. I said, oh, now I've had it. You pour that out in the sink. I'm going, is this it? I have enough. You know, so she just made me pour out the rest of the bottle of pop. And that was the discipline. Okay, but anyway, not very effective discipline, Mom. I'm full. You know, so you just took, took the drink away from the rest of the family, but hey, I'm great. <laughs> um, God disciplines us for our good, and he's real good at it. You know, and, and he accomplishes his purpose. Look what it says. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. See that? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. You say, Mike, I'm going through something painful. What did I do wrong? Nothing. The Lord disciplines those he loves. If you're going through turbulent waters, it's not just about I have to learn this thing. God treats his children that way. Here's what's scary. Nothing in your life is uncomfortable. Be afraid. It says, if you are not disciplined, listen to me. If you are not disciplined, then you are, what did that verse say? Illegitimate children. God disciplines his kids. Everything's fine in your life. I'm not going to tell you then go ask to get beat up, but don't feel real good about that. Everything in your life fine, no physical, no mental, no social, no spiritual issues, cruising through life, yep, God must really love me. Eh. God disciplines those he loves. Wow. You're going through some stuff? You think that God must have taken off on you? Not a chance. Not a chance. Things are great. Boy, me and God must be, makes me nervous. Nothing wrong makes me nervous because God introduces painful circumstances into the lives of those he loves. That's what it says. I'll give you an illustration. We'll listen to a song and we'll be done. Uh, when I think about this one, I've shared this before. Remember that thing with the cliff? Picture that guy on the cliff. Here's what I'd like you to picture. There's a couple of belay lines, and I've talked about this before. Good image, though. I like it. Um, I got a harness on, and this is, I'm like, say this is the cliff face here. Okay, cliff face. I've got some, some lines, some harnesses. Let's say three of them attached to the belt, harness around me. These lines are attached to the top of the cliff. This middle one is the God belay line. This is the main line, the one that will support me. These are alternate lines. So I'm um, secure? Yep, absolutely. Okay, yeah, we got we get to there. Okay, good purposes. Show faith and grow faith. So we're I say, yep, I'm really trusting in this middle line. What God seems to do, He He jeopardizes, He He takes away some of the other securities. Let's call this great social life. And let's call this money. Money, great social life, God. 
How's your faith? Great. Just wonderful. Things right? Yep, I couldn't be better. Trust in God? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Then I start to see, yeah, just waiting for a vacancy in the Trinity. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, friends start to abandon me. Okay? <laughs> when this happens and this line starts to fray, that's really going to show where my faith is, isn't it? How much weight do I have on this is indicated by how much I freak out when it starts to go. It starts to fray. <laughs> well, now I know. I know. I said I had all my weight on this line, but I had a bunch of weight on that line because when that line went, I started to freak out. Or finances. I thought everything was fine, but now I learn that it isn't. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, now I know that because I went through this difficult circumstance, this line got frayed or this line got frayed, at least I know the truth now. I said, oh, just me and you, but my reaction shows, if I'm down to this line, <laughs> it shows my faith, and that's what tests of faith do. They show the extent to which our security is based on other than God. It shows faith. But here's the good news, it also grows faith. Let's say I have three lines. And then it's like, boink, oh, gosh, boink, and now, <laughs> but guess what happens? <laughs> I'm not falling. One line. I'm not falling. I thought that without money I'd fall. <laughs> I'm not. He's holding me up. I thought without a social network, I'd be finished. But look at me. One line, it grows faith. And that's what tests of faith do. They both show and grow faith. I think it's true that when we're suspended by the God, by the God line, and some of you, that's where you are, is all you have. You know what the deal is, though? Let's cue up the song, Dave. When God is all you have, you discover that he's all you need. Great song by Steve Camp. We'll probably play it this week and next week. Powerful song. Drink in the lyrics. It talks about God's sufficiency, and then we'll close our service in prayer. Mm. Uh, Father, I'm thankful that you are a good father. You are not sadistic or absentee. You don't guarantee us that things go great in this life, but you do guarantee us that even though we face fearful situations that you will not leave us alone, that you put us in situations where we have to lean into circumstances that feel like you don't love us, but you would have us learn to base our confidence on what you say rather than what we see. And you show us our faith and grow our faith. I, I ask that you would help us to trust you more, really hard. Help us to draw our sense of confidence from what you say. Help us in our unbelief. Thanks that you're a good dad. I'm really grateful for that. Thanks for being a good dad. Teach us to love you, to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, how your faith is tested. <laughs>